in the previous lecture which was an introduction we have seen some of the devices and we have seen why the semiconductor devices are important how they help us to build better systems in electrical engineering we also saw what are the various topics we are going to cover in this course in today's lecture we will discuss the uniqueness and evolution of semiconductor technology now some of the material uh, in this lecture has been taken from the chapter origin and personality of microelectronics in the book titled transistors fundamentals for the integrated circuit engineer this book uh, has been authored by r m warner and b l grung it's a very nice book and if you uh, get a chance to uh, look at this book you please uh, go through it let us begin by trying to understand what is technology and then we will see what is semiconductor technology now technology means processing of material energy or information so as to develop a useful product in most general terms this is the definition of technology so you could either process a material or energy in some form or even information okay so that's why we have nowadays what is called information technology now when does the technology become high technology when the processing conditions are very stringent and when the product that you get it has very high reliability and performance and a low cost so either you get the same performance and reliability but at a lower cost or at the same cost you get much higher reliability and performance then the technology is called high technology so semiconductor technology is a materials oriented high technology that is it involves processing of material and you get products which have high reliability and much higher performance let me give you an example supposing you take the invention of the transistor how it has changed the reliability and performance of systems now before the transistor was invented the device that was being used for amplification was a vacuum tube triode okay it was made in vacuum tube now the vacuum tube the size of the vacuum tube is large if any of you have seen a vacuum tube you would know compare the size of a vacuum tube and a transistor the size is large then the vacuum tube is fragile because it has a glass casing okay so uh, it is said that when they built the first computer using vacuum tubes the area occupied by the computer was something like 900 square feet and they had a number of engineers to maintain this whole system because it would fail very often okay and another important problem was how to dissipate the heat generated so whereas you compare a computer that we use today right a notebook computer or nowadays you even have palm top computers see the power dissipated right see the size and see the speed so you are getting much higher performance and reliability right the computers are very reliable so this is what the semiconductor technology has done that it has given you products which are very highly reliable and which have much better performance now so it is important for us to know that this advantage is achieved only because the material is processed under very stringent conditions that is a price you are paying so that let us understand that a little in little more detail so what are the processing conditions in semiconductor technology so what is shown here is a clean room where semiconductors are processed so you see you can't make devices in open air you can't make semiconductor devices in open air okay so first stringent condition is that you need a single crystal material you make most of the semiconductor devices are made in single crystal material this is a very stringent condition because a single crystal material is means uh, the arrangement of atom should be very very regular throughout the size of the crystal 
So, a lot of uh, energy and cost you are expending in getting a single crystal material, single crystal growth of single crystal material, okay. So, that is the first stringent condition. The next stringent condition is an ultra clean environment. So, that is what is seen in this diagram here. So, you see the person who is processing has uh, is wearing a mask and some kind of a attire right which prevents any dirt from him getting into the environment okay. So, this is not only for protecting him the person against chemicals and so on, but it is for protecting the environment right against pollution by the person okay. So, you must understand this that this when the size of the transistor is very very small of the order of microns or even sub micron it means that even a very small dust particle right can kill a few transistors on the chip okay. Now, how do you measure the cleanliness of environment? So, people talk about the class, class of the environment. The, for example, a class 10 clean room, what does it mean? It means that there are no more than 10 particles of size more than fractions of a micron, for example, 0.3 micron in per cubic feet. Okay. So, a class 10 clean room means the number of dust particles of size more than 0.3 microns is no more than 10 per cubic feet. Okay. To give you some idea of what is involved in creating such a clean room, which is what is required for semiconductor processing, okay. Open air, the class is more than more than a million. It can be as bad as that, okay. So, a lot of uh, cost and energy is involved in reducing this particle count to class 10. Then another stringent condition, okay, the water. You need water for processing materials. So, the water should not have ions, it should be pure. So, the water used in semiconductor processing is called deionized water. DI water. So, how do you measure the cleanliness of water? You use the resistivity, okay, resistivity of water. So, the resistivity of tap water is about 20 kilo ohm centimeter tap water. Whereas, the resistivity of water that is used for semiconductor processing has to be as high as maybe 20 mega ohms. So, you have to remove the ions from the water so that you get clean water. Then you have clean chemicals ultra clean chemicals. So, if you look at the bottles that are used chemical bottles containing chemicals, if you have uh, when you were doing experiments in chemistry, if you have taken care to see the labels on the bottles on the chemicals, there are several grades of chemicals starting from the lowest grade like laboratory grade, then you have analytical grade. So, then semiconductor grade okay, 
and even in semiconductor grade now you have what is called the MOS grade MOS metal oxide semiconductor grade because to make MOS transistors your cleanliness has to be even higher. So they have introduced what is called MOS grade chemicals okay. So gases also have to be similarly ultra pure. So these conditions are rather stringent. In fact the amount of capital investment that you must do because of these reasons into a functioning semiconductor manufacturing unit is enormously high. Even a simple semiconductor unit making discrete devices the investment would be something like 500 crore rupees. So it is said that uh, if you want to compare different nations in terms of the wealth they have all that you need to do is just count the number of semiconductor factories these countries have okay. So number of semiconductor factories is an index of the wealth of a country. So this is the reason why even though the products are very uh, useful and very high performance okay unless you have a large amount of capital invest invested into this you cannot make these products. So you can call this as one of the limitations of the technology okay. Now in spite of the high capital investment the cost of the product is becoming lower because the production volume is very high. You are able to generate new applications with products which are high performance which are very light and so your production volume is becoming very high and that is how the initial capital investment uh, the cost that you are putting in right it gets divided and that is why the computers and pocket calculators and so on are becoming so affordable. So one big unit trying to make large number of products that is how this particular technology works okay. So it has its advantages and disadvantages. The disadvantage is only a very rich country or a rich man can set up such a unit and then he or she may be able to control that is a disadvantage of this okay. So there are many aspects of technology that one needs to understand. I have just uh, focused here a few of them okay which are related to the semiconductor technology. Now another thing is the sophisticated equipment which is also responsible for the high cost of the semiconductor unit. So most of the equipment for example that we use for this manufacture in India are is imported. So you can see in this diagram also the clean air benches okay the environment which is maintaining higher level of cleanliness in the place that you are processing. The, the room itself is clean okay but the particular environment in which you are processing the silicon pieces and so on subjecting it to various uh, chemicals is even more cleaner okay. So these for example here what you see these are called the clean air benches. In fact this person is processing in a clean air bench. The cleanliness is maintained of the air a higher cleanliness is maintained by maintaining a slightly positive pressure in the region where the processing takes place. So the air is sucked in from outside through uh, some filters and then it is pumped into this region and then the air flows out. So this way positive pressure is maintained constantly air is coming out of that region. So that is how you can prevent dust particles and other things from entering into the region okay that is what how the cleaner bench is made. Let us discuss some other things related to this technology. Products of semiconductor technology unlike in many other technologies the use of the products becomes progressively easy with advancement of technology. This is a very unique feature of semiconductor technology. To give you an idea supposing you take automobile technology. In automobile technology let us take the products which will reflect advancement in technology. Start with a let us start with a cycle not really an automobile but you know the simplest thing that gives you mobility. So start with a cycle then go to a scooter then go to a car then you can go to maybe an aircraft and then probably you can uh, talk about a spacecraft okay. So you see advancement in technology the person who is operating this vehicle 
needs higher and higher levels of skill. Everybody, almost everybody can ride a cycle, okay. Fewer can ride a scooter and then for car again you need a much better training and then you go to the aircraft and then you go to the spacecraft. This is one example where as a technology advances you need higher and higher levels of skill to use the product. Whereas in the case of semiconductor technology what you find is as the technology advances it becomes more and more user friendly. So even an illiterate person right can use this um, can make use of the products. The level of skill required is very less. There is something very positive about this. Another unique feature of this technology is that the second point in the slide that is performance of new products can be predicted using relatively simple models and this is because you are using a single crystal material right. Though single crystal material is uh, difficult to make but the performance of devices which are made in this material is easy to predict because you have regular arrangement of atoms okay. So modeling is easy that is why you have so many simulators and so on which are being used to predict new devices even before you make them. This is not something that is easy in, in other materials for example in glass and steel the performances cannot be predicted so easily because these are not single crystal materials okay. Now let us come to the training required in semiconductor technology. The theory of semiconductors is abstract and also if you see the technology in its uh, totality it is highly interdisciplinary. So for this reason you need a strong training okay in mathematics as well as in sciences to really be effective in this technology. So a person who is doing uh, working with steel or glass the level of training required is much less than a person who is to be trained in semiconductor technology. So you will see that uh, a semiconductor industry or lab for example appoints uh, people ranging from mathematicians, chemists, physicists, material scientists, electrical engineers, right chemical engineers. So they need people of all use to really make the technology work. So that is why we have students undergoing a theory course before they take to the practicals. Those who are working with steel and glass can start playing with the material and with a large number of trial and error they can come to some understanding of the material. But that is not the way one enters the semiconductor technology. One does not start playing with silicon okay and then you find you get interested so let us understand this more and then let us take a course that is not the way it works okay. So you have a course on devices and so on and technology and then you start practicing it. So let us look at the evolution of this technology. What I said just now that a high level of training is required this because in this technology the science came first and the empiricism has come later. Some of these features we will see when we see the sequence of events which I am going to just uh, talk about in a short while. Again taking the example of other materials like glass and steel people have been working with these materials for hundreds or maybe thousands of years. They did not have an understanding of the atomic structure of or molecular structure of steel or the structure of the glass before they started working with these materials. But by doing lot of trial and error experiments they have perfected the art of making better and better steel and glass and so on. The understanding of the structure has come only recently in last 200 years or something like that. Of course that must have also helped them to build better materials there is no doubt. But a lot of progress has taken place even before the science of the materials was understood. But that is not true of semiconductors. In semiconductors first came the science that is lot of experiments were done and they found that semiconductor materials have different set of properties than metals and insulators then they tried to understand the structure and so on and after they understood the structure then they realized that maybe you can do a large number of things with this particular material and that is how the 
this area has acquired importance. So, this is what is meant by science first empiricism next trial and error experiments come later after understanding the science. The only other example in this category is the nuclear science or nuclear technology even there the science came first and then the empiricism or the practice of this. The second important point is that in the growth of this technology scientists, engineers and inventors all these three types of people have contributed extensively. Often we uh, use these terms interchangeably scientists, engineers and inventors many times these are used interchangeably, but it is not true if you uh, try to look at the people who have been working and you understand what is science, what is engineering, what is invention the type of people their capabilities their way of working is quite different. Okay? So, a person who is a good engineer may not be a scientist similarly an inventor need not be a good scientist or there can be a scientist who is not an inventor. Okay? So, these three types of people have contributed extensively to this technology. We will see a little bit on the science engineering and invention because it has relationship to this uh, topic that we are discussing. Another important thing that you need to understand about evolution is that this technology the interest in this technology was driven initially by the need to improve communications. How to improve communications, how to make communication faster, okay, more effective that was the goal. So, in the beginning it was found that this technology will help you to improve communications that is how the interest developed, but after the technology developed now the communication is being driven by all the developments that you have in this technology. It is other way around now the communication field is being driven by the solid state field. So, let us understand the difference between science engineering and invention. In science the ultimate goal is publication of new knowledge frequently mathematical. Okay, the ultimate goal of a scientist is to publish a book, a paper or something like that, okay, which deals with which establishes new links and patterns of understanding and integrates seemingly unrelated observations and phenomena into a grand pattern that is the job of a scientist. So, definitely a scientist is uh, highly intellectually endowed, but the important thing is whatever he does he or she does need not result in a useful product it is some sort of a publication which details this knowledge. As against this since we are supposed to be engineers at least IITs is, are supposed to produce engineers or inventors okay, those who have a few characteristics. So, what are those characteristics let us see. So, engineering the ultimate goal is the product the requirements for engineering are knowledge of scientific principles and applied mathematics hands on experience this is very important hands on experience. So, if someone says that he or she is working in the area of semiconductor technology and is an engineer or a technologist then it is not sufficient to just take a few courses and under and understand what are the fabrication steps in the for a semiconductor device and how a device works and so on. He or she must have hands on experience must have used the material processed it and so on then ability to approximate this is another important property an engineer must have. So, engineer must be able to work with very simple formulae derive simple formulae for design purposes. And then finally, one aspect of engineering uh, that is related to economics and so on. So, unlike science you cannot dealing engineering from economics that much. Okay. So, entrepreneurship that is you must have a person who sets up a unit that translates all this practical knowledge and so on into a useful product. Okay? So, entrepreneurship. So, in fact the level of engineering in any uh, country also depends on what is the what is the extent of entrepreneurship in the society. How many people are trying to set up units which will make products they might fail, but the question is how many trials are being made. So, it is found that those countries which are advanced engineering okay, their number of people who try to set up units who try to be entrepreneurs is very very high. If you compare for example, uh, United States 
and India. Okay, the United States you will find the number of entrepreneurs is very large. Maybe one in four only succeed. Okay, but the number who are trying is very high. So this is also an important requirement for engineering. Let's look at invention. What is invention? It is a useful new combination. Let us consider examples in the context of semiconductor technology. So I have given here two examples. One is called the planar process and the other is the pocket calculator. So planar process is a process invention and uh, pocket calculator is a product invention. Let us discuss this point in little more detail. What is the planar process? In fact, the person who worked with this planar process, who used it for making ICs has got a Nobel Prize recently. You know all of them. Who is the person who got the prize? In fact, this is one. This is the only example where an engineer has been given a Nobel Prize for the invention because the integrated circuit has revolutionized the entire electrical engineering, and in fact, you can say the whole life. Okay, the number of systems, different kinds of systems that have been built, and the amount of new science that has been generated because in trying to understand integrated circuit is so large that the person was given a Nobel Prize. Okay? So that is why let us look at this planar process. What is this? You can make a diode as follows, which was the initial process that was used in olden days for making it. when I say olden days that means in the beginning of the evolution of semiconductor technology that is maybe 50 years ago. So this is a structure of a P n junction made by this is a structure of a p injunction made by what is called the MISA process. That is the structure looks like a MISA pyramid. So here how is this device made? Well you have a wafer or a piece of silicon. n type silicon whole of which at the surface is con converted into p type the size in those days could be 2 inch diameter so it's a circular wafer a circular piece the thickness of this is of the order of 200 microns To give you a feel for this thickness, the human hair is about 50 microns diameter, right? Human hair is 50 microns diameter. So this is about four times the thickness of the human hair. This thickness all depends on this diameter because you must be able to handle the silicon piece mechanically. So for two inch diameter wafer, it is about say 200. convert whole of the surface into p type but your individual diode is very very small so you have to separate this particular wafer into individual diodes so how do you do that now that is where what you do is you etch out locally materials something like this And then you dice or break the wafer at these points. Now each of this 
device is what is shown here separated. When you separate this particular wafer into devices, what will happen is the surface will be exposed to the atmosphere, this surface here and impurities can get in there and that will which will spoil the characteristics of this diode. So what is done is you have what is called a passivation layer, this is passivation. So it is some uh, material which you put here so that the surface junction surface is protected from environment. So this is the MISA process okay. What we want to talk about is the planar process. So after understanding the MISA process now you will appreciate the uh, innovation involved in the planar process. The these particular diodes were quite leaky that is the leakage current was high. You see the diode characteristics. This is current versus voltage. So reverse characteristics this represents the leakage current. that leakage current was high for these devices. Now le let us look at the structure of a diode which is made by the planar process. So first I will draw the individual diode structure and then we will uh, discuss how this individual diode is separated from a complete wafer. This is the structure of a planar process a device made by planar process. So here what is happening is this is a, this is a so called passivation layer made of silicon dioxide. And what you find here is the junction is on a plane surface that is why it is called a planar process. The junction is the p-n junction is exposed to the atmosphere and that uh, wherever it is exposed that is on a plane surface that is why it is called a planar process. All the devices are made on a single plane. Here however you can see that is not a planar device because the structure adds itself as you can see it is like a MISA. So advantage of this is now the uh, p n junction is automatically passivated. It turns out that the silicon silicon dioxide interface can be made of a very high quality okay and the leakage current of these devices is therefore much lower. That is not the only advantage of uh, the planar, planar process or rather even the main advantage. The main advantage is now it makes it very easy for a person to integrate various devices on a single surface. That is the main property of the planar process. You can make different devices in a single plane. So I can have a diode like this and then I can have a transistor.
So this is an example where I am showing a diode and a transistor in the same silicon wafer. So this is a so called emitter contact, this is a so called base contact and this is a so called collector contact, they are all in the same plane. You look at this uh, MISA process, here this is the top contact and this is the bottom contact, okay. Whereas for a PN diode, planar diode, both the contacts can be on the top. So this is P contact and this is N contact. That is what is happening here for a transistor also that all the contacts emitter, base and collector are on the top on the same plane. So you can integrate this very easily. I can run a metal line supposing I want to connect let us say this region to a diode for some reason. I can just run a metal line here and connect. So interconnection of various devices on a single plane that is uniqueness of this and it is this arrangement that enables you to build large number of millions of transistors or devices on a single silicon wafer because you can go on shrinking the sizes and you can increase the density of the circuit. Incidentally these two regions are called isolation regions which should be P type so that the P injunction along this area isolates this transistor from other devices and prevents unwanted interconnections between them. So a PN diode for example made by planar process will have much lower leakage current than a PN diode made by MISA process. Also MISA process will not enable you to integrate various devices. So here how is this uh, diode made? The sequence of steps is as follows. You take the same wafer, say N type wafer, but the first step in the planar process is to grow the silicon dioxide layer which is the so called passivation layer. Then you etch windows that is areas where you want the P region, you remove the silicon dioxide. And then in these regions you create P regions by diffusion, by a process called diffusion that is introduce impurities through this particular window so as to create the P regions. Now automatically what happens is since the impurities diffuse inside they also diffuse sideways and the junction goes and sits under the passivation layer automatically it is under the passivation layer okay. So and this as I have said the silicon silicon dioxide interface can be ma made of a very high quality it is possible to make very high quality interface using simple means and therefore that is this is what enables you to get very low leakage current and very good passivation okay. The surface is protected against the environment. So now this was a process invention which made possible putting larger and larger number of devices in smaller and smaller area, the planar process. Now you have some such invention, it gives you a jump, okay. It opens up many possibilities. Now the next question arose that okay, you have the capability of integrating large number of devices in a small area, but what do you do with this capability? What product do you make? Because this is also very important, what is the product that will be very useful out of this particular capability. So in fact, the uh, one of the first products that were thought of was the pocket calculator. 
So someone said this technology we can use and we can make a, a small device which will calculate okay and everybody can have uh, this device in his pocket is his or her pocket. So in fact when the suggestion was made people laughed at it and they said this is not going to be very useful at all who wants to use a calculator right but nowadays we know that almost everybody needs a calculator. So the product invention of a pocket calculator is supposed to be a very important invention it is a it looks like a very simple idea okay that is how all inventions which are very wide applicability all inventions which have wide applicability their property is that they are very simple in their conception. So the pocket calculator is a product invention which showed how you can exploit this planar process capability okay and make a useful product. So having understood the uh, science engineering invention let us see how these three kinds of people have contributed to the growth of semiconductor technology. Here what I have done is I have listed a number of events important events in the chronological order. The events are listed for communications field area of communications because as we have said the interest in this technology initially arose because of the need to improve communications and then side by side the developments in solid state the science of solid state okay semiconductor materials and so on. So one can trace it back to about 1820 the development that initiated the communications field was magnetism from electricity and vice versa okay or state and Faraday the idea of electromagnetic induction and so on. So here you have the suffix indicated against uh, the names of the persons associated with this event uh, S stands for a scientist I stands for an inventor and uh, E stands for an engineer. So one of the purposes of this particular chronology is to show how a scientist develops an idea and then comes an inventor who exploits it and makes a useful product right that generates that uh, uh, requires sometimes knowledge of some new observations. So again uh, you have a scientist who comes in there and who explains some of these new observations this results in more knowledge and new knowledge which again there is an inventor coming in who exploits this new knowledge that is developed. So you have this sequence going on okay cycle scientist inventor scientist inventor and so on. So here for example in communications you can see that after the development of uh, uh, after the uh, understanding of ideas of magnetism from electricity Morse was an inventor who came up and proposed the telegraph how to use these ideas for communication. So this is communication with wires then you have a theory of electromagnetism being given by Maxwell on the right hand side you can see the developments in solid state here the two strands are separate there is no connection between them as of now as in 1820. So you have a set of scientists studying the solid state materials so thermoelectric property right it so they were studying the thermoelectric property of various materials they found some materials seem to be showing some unique features okay in this property then came the intrinsic property and photovoltaic effect uh, by Faraday studies by Faraday and Beckwell, Beckwell. then photoconductivity after studies of all these properties there was an inventor who suggested that we can use these unique properties of materials till then it was not known or the word semiconductor was not coined by 1870 or so on even in 1870s the word semiconductor was not coined but the scientists had understood that there was there were some materials which behaved in a peculiar fashion neither like metals nor like insulators. So Braun was an inventor who said that okay you can put a metal to this contact to this material and it will have a rectifying property instead of having a resistive property that is 
the current for one polarity of voltage is very different from the current for other polarity. And then he said that this kind of device we can use in communications for detection. Okay. So, first was first device that was proposed by was an inventor uh, Braun and thereafter again you have scientists studying the uh, properties of semiconductors in the solid state field. Let us go further telephone was an invention by Bell, I will write Graham Bell for improving the communications. After that you had experimental proof of electromagnetic waves by Hertz who was a scientist. Maxwell gave the theory for electromagnetism, but the presence of electromagnetic waves practically was demonstrated by Hertz. So, moment this was demonstrated came an inventor that is uh, Bose Marconi there is still some confusion as to who is the original inventor of wireless communication. Latest uh, information is that Bose was probably ahead of Marconi in this. Then you had vacuum tube diode and triode again an inventor okay, coming up and proposing this device for detection in wireless communication okay, radio waves. How do you detect the radio waves? You use this device for detection. On the right hand side here you see magneto resistance being studied in solid state and then the understanding of quantum mechanics by Max Planck and photoelectric effect by Einstein. Now it is in 1910 that the word semiconductor was coined. Okay. They found that this uh, set of materials had so many unique properties that they wanted to give it a separate name which is not an insulator, not a metal, okay, not a conductor. So, the word semiconductor was coined in 1910. At around this time, the uh, communications field is still developing. You can see that uh, positive feedback and sine wave oscillator. How do you generate uh, the signals required for communication? Okay. This was the topic that was addressed by Armstrong. You proceed uh, further in the area of communications you have uh, an engineer coming in here after Armstrong also as you can see was an engineer and inventor. Okay. Similarly, Harold Black who proposed a negative feedback which was very useful in building good amplifiers again for communication purposes. Then you had frequency modulation Armstrong proposed. So, you had lot of development in the field of communications here. Now, after 1920, because of the importance of radar in World War II, this is the important event which actually brought the communications and solid state fields together. There was suddenly a lot of interest in the solid state area because they found that using the vacuum tube which was being used for detection in communications, they could not go to very high frequencies. Okay. And that is where they found that the diode proposed by Braun which was simply being considered as a rectifying device was very useful as a detector instead of a vacuum tube uh, diode you use a solid state diode right it has much better it is a very small size it has a small capacitance and therefore you can use it at high frequencies so they started perfecting this device okay now this is actually the event where up beyond this the solid state and communications which were the areas which were separate okay they came together and thereafter you have you can see here you have an inventor coming in in this area of solid state the semiconductor triode. How do you if a bronze diode can replace a vacuum tube diode and give you much better performance people thought why cannot you replace the vacuum tube triode vacuum tube amplifier by a solid state amplifier. So, someone suggested how you can translate this idea of vacuum tubes into a solid state field. When we discuss the MOSFET, we will discuss about this particular invention of the semiconductor triode in little more detail, the field effect transistor. And thereafter, the interest in the area of semiconductors grew uh, really exponentially and then came you can see a large number of models to explain the behavior of semiconductor devices, the important thing being the first important model being the energy band model, then the theory of rectifying junctions and so on. And in around 19, 
1950 that is in exactly 1947 was the invention of the first solid state amplifier that is the or discovery you can say the BJT bipolar junction transistor. So, although the idea the first transistor that was proposed is a field effect transistor okay. The first device that was made is a bipolar junction transistor because they were not able to make field effect transistor and in trying to study trying to understand why field effect transistors were difficult to make they discovered accidentally the bipolar transistor. So, and then thereafter you have the planar process being used for integrated circuit by noise and Kilby. So, in fact Kilby got the Nobel prize for, uh, for his invention of integrated circuit and thereafter now we have the solid state area progressing and driving the communications. So, you had a series of devices being proposed MESFET proposed by Mead then you had uh, medium scale integration the integration of devices into a IC started filters then you had large scale integration being used for making a random access memory and analog to digital converters microprocessors and so on. Then in 1980s you had the HEMT high electron mobility transistor and then in integrated circuits you had VLSI that is 64 kilobit random access memory. In 1990s you had three dimensional integration that is you integrate not only on a plane but also in the vertical dimension. Now most recently we have had nano electronics coming up wherein we make devices out of either nano crystalline materials or we make devices which are of nano dimensions but made in crystalline materials. Now next after having seen what is the way the semiconductor technology has evolved and how scientists engineers and inventors have contributed to this evolution let us briefly review what is the status in India of this technology. Broadly we could divide the technology into three levels the software level the hardware level which involves architecture and assembly and finally the devices or components level which is heavily dependent on materials. The capability index for these technologies is indicated here we are doing very well in software. So, A that is excellent or very good we are exporting software hardware level we are good we can make supercomputers and we are sending satellites into the space. So, this level involves integrating components and making systems however, at the devices or components level we need improve improvement that is presently the level is uh, not satisfactory U stands for unsatisfactory and we are improving but we need to improve more. The reason why we are weak at the devices or components level is because we are weak in the area of materials oriented technology. So, we import the technology for making sewing needles which is based on the steel processing of steel material. So, it is not surprising that we import technologies for making semiconductor devices semiconductor and steel both are materials. Now, the chain is only as strong as the weakest link. So, the level of engineering or technology in India can be can become excellent only if all the three levels we are strong and the chain is strong. Now, let us see as a part of the status in India what are the various industries research laboratories and academic institutes which are participating in development of technology. So, in industries we have Bharat Electronics Limited Bangalore. Continental Devices India Limited CDIL New Delhi then we have semiconductor complex Chandigarh then we have Indian telephone industries that is ITI Bangalore. Some of the research laboratories are the solid state physics laboratory in New Delhi the central electronic engineering research institute Siri in Pilani Rajasthan. Then there are academic institutes which are participating in the development which have small laboratories, but which have strong teaching programs in this area. These are the Indian Institute of Institutes of Technology and the Indian Institute of Science Bangalore. One of the purposes of developing the video lectures is to have more colleges in the country involved in teaching of this technology, which is advancing rapidly. 
Now in the end of this lecture, I would like to uh, tell you what is the way the remaining lectures will be conducted. So for the remaining lectures, we will have 20 minutes of lecturing followed by about 8 minutes of discussion and then we again have 20 minutes of lecturing followed by about 8 minutes of discussion. This is an approximate uh, idea of the division of the time of 56 minutes into lectures and discussion which involves question answers. Then problems and solutions are provided in a separate CD. Some problems will be solved in the class but some, some will be given to you and uh, you will have to solve them yourself. These are provided on a separate CD. Then we also have a separate CD for discussion of select problems and their solutions. And finally, what are the reference materials? Where apart from listening to this uh, video lectures, you could refer to textbooks which are available. There are many textbooks uh, such as textbooks by uh, MS Tyagi of IIT Kanpur on in introduction to semiconductor materials and devices. In addition to and then Ben Streetman uh, his book on semiconductor electronic devices. Now apart from this I would also urge you to use the internet for uh, understanding various concepts and I will demonstrate to you in the remaining lectures how internet can be used.